Dr. Singh, what impact does conflict have on agriculture and other activities in rural areas? Um, I'm not going to talk about more about the, the impact on the physical infrastructure per se, but I'm more interested in the human impact of conflict on, on agriculture. And the most immediate impact is the, uh, the folks who work on, on, in farming, and that's largely women. And oftentimes in most conflicts, um, it's men who fight, but the women suffer the most. And, and they're the ones who do, in Af especially in Africa, for example, they're the ones who are actually in the field planting and, and harvesting. And as soon as conflict breaks out, um, oftentimes women are targets, easy targets for, for conflict, and they're the ones that are affected the most. And that immediate impact on agriculture is the um, almost immediate cessation of, of growing and harvesting. And that's, that, that's the, what's the most immediate impact on agriculture. And that's often, it's often missed. We've talk, we often talk about the big, big picture of food economy, but it's the people who matter the most who have driven away from the fields who cannot go back and actually start planting and harvesting. And I think that, that aspect is, uh, the human aspect of that is, it's, I mean, it's often implied, but I think there must be more, needs to be a more proactive approach to that. So we're not just uh, concerned about food security, but also livelihoods and... Livelihoods. Uh, food security is a big aspect, but food security is such a broad term, and it's often identified with the actual food itself and not yes. the people behind the food. And I think we need to broaden the term to include the human aspect of it, the human aspect of food security. Uh, and that's, that's often missed. Well, then how do you go about rebuilding, whether it's agriculture or mining or other activities? What steps do you take to get back on track? It's a good question. It's actually very hard to answer. Everything's based on, you know, the, the easy answer is based on context. But, but that's sort of a, it's, it's a, the way to actually avoid the real question is um, what's ex existing at that point in time when you start rebuilding? And uh, different wars leave different infrastructures at different points of time. And depending on what you have left, uh, you, you tend to rebuild from there. So you need to do an assessment. An assess uh, important thing is an assessment of what is there that you can build from. And then it's, and then it's, and then it's, a, it's a philosophical thing of accentuating the positive rather than the negatives of what's been lost. And building on the positive aspect, what can we build from what we have right now to something that's more sustainable. And, um, and oftentimes after war, you have uh, two things that take place. You have a, a, almost a decimation of the male, adult male population, and you have women who've been raped and who have almost lost the means to grow and have livelihoods. So those two aspects, are in th in the third, that's, that's two of the immediate aspects of the adult population, but then what happens is when you lose the adult population, you're left with a huge youth bulge. That's, where that's, and that's, that's, a t that's the time bomb that you know, but we've been trying to grapple with is the youth, the youth aspect of, of conflict. Uh, for example, in East Timor, uh, after, the con after, the, after the independence, I guess it was 50% of the population was under the age of 18. Um, so that a lot of these things combined, you know, it's very combustible. And you've, seen in, uh, you've seen in Sierra Leone, a lot of the youth were the ones, and LRA is another example in Uganda, and Liberia, they were the youth have, uh, are the ones that actually commit most of the violence. But they're also the solution to the problem, too. And, uh, and part of the social capital is a cycle of social trauma. How do you, how do you re engage youth who can make more money by wielding a gun than growing a crop, which has a long term aspect to mm -hmm. it? And you know, had to wait for, you know, a few months before they can earn a living versus a gun's immediate economic return. Uh, and we've, I don't, I have not yet seen an immediate uh, answer to that. The only, only thing I can think of that has a, that can actually do it is infrastructure rebuilding, heavy investment in infrastructure, um, capital works programs that provide the retraining programs and capital works programs that can rebuild that infrastructure that's lost, um, provide gainful employment, reinvigorate the economy. Um, and that sort of that that aspect, uh, oftentimes the you know, World Bank and other donors have taken that. Our government has not done as much as we, we, we've, been, we've been focused more on the social side of it. But I think it, there's, it needs to be a concerted effort from the donor community to work on that. But the other thing I want to point out is, you mentioned war. You mentioned the war economies. There are people winning in this battle. It's not just you know we look at the losses, but the warlords, the spoilers who have gained from this. Those resources need to be recaptured, one way or the other. Um, 
And so we capture the control of the resources that are under the these, for example, Eastern Congo, where you warlords. have, you know, you still have issues of uh, the part, large parts of the mining economy in informal control. And you know, we we take the we take the term informal to you know, to uh, to literally, because I don't think it's informal. They actually have formal links with people outside of the country. So I don't I don't so using the word informal. Whereas the formal is a very poor distinction. It's People are making money and their money is going into banks. The youth are one of the toughest places to work because they've, oftentimes they're battle scarred and carry a lot of trauma with them. Um, uh, addressing their needs is paramount. And any, any, any social investment must take into account the youth aspect. Uh, even for for a corporation, um, my current after leaving the government, my current position right now, where I work with companies who are trying to invest in, in economies that you know that are fragile in many ways. But overcome that fragility if you take a 20-year time horizon and you, you do enough homework in the cultural context and invest in local community and invest in your your potential youth who will be your next employees. Um, you not only have a cost savings, but you also have a huge return on investment. But how can you help um, mitigate those risks, and how can you encourage the private sector investment and business activity? How do you make that transition? Well, that's where I think we need to be more creative with our with our, our current instruments. We have way too many bureaucracies: Trade and Development Authority. We got OPEC, Exim Bank, USAID, MCC, all competing, you know, in a way that hasn't really gelled and how do we form a current, how do we form a, a coherent policy that will allow, let's say, our American company to want to invest there. Okay, from from the American, from American perspective. Because you know, if you want, you know, the Europeans have been there for a long time. They they have no problems investing, reinvesting in Africa. They have a long history with Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you know, you know, if you were, if you talk to people on the street, they love Americans. We bring a different flavor to the whole equation. But the problem is we stay too short. We need to build a relationship that's long term in nature. It's it's a it's an, it needs to be an ongoing type of partnership. Commitment. Commitment. It's mm -hmm. it's a marriage. Yes. And I think we've, we've we've we need to move away from that. We've done that with South America. We've done that with Europeans. We've done that in Asia. Why not in Africa? Uh, I think that's uh, I don't I, I'm going to get off my soapbox in Africa, but I think that's sort of where the, the rubber hits the road, and that's where the that's that's the biggest emerging market we have as a company, as a country, is and countries and Europeans involved. Is how do we make that a better place? Mm -hmm. Not just for them, but for ourselves too. It's a, it's a give and take. Well, are there any other comments that you might want to make? Because I, I certainly think you've already given us some insights, but perhaps there's uh, a final comment <laughs> to, or observation. Well, that I, you'd I, like I'm to sorry, make. I, can, I can continue on forever, but uh, I think the, the main thing is uh, is is uh, developing a coherent policy with just within the U.S. government itself first before we branch out to multilaterally. Uh, if we have, if we put a, f a good first step forward, uh, harmonize our current instruments, it makes it a whole lot easier for the others to work along with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.